Thank you so much for being at the Wednesday prayer meeting. Even on a rainy Wednesday night, you guys are here so faithful. Glad that you're here as we continue talking about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And for the last several weeks, we've been talking about the power of the Holy Spirit, specifically the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I'm excited to be able to report to you that so far this year, over 50 people have received the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Can we just give the Lord praise for that? I believe our church has been leaning in, been seeking. You've been coming on Wednesday nights, spending time at the altar. The Lord has been ministering to us in a powerful way, pouring more of His Spirit out on us. And, and we're so thankful for that. But now I want to I shift to begin talking about the difference the Holy Spirit makes and the fruit that we should see as a result of the work of the Spirit in our lives. You know, the fruit of something is the evidence that that thing is what we say it is, right? When something bears fruit, it bears evidence to its character, its substance, its identity. And so if we say that's an apple tree, well, we should expect to see apples. If we say that's a tomato plant, we should expect to see tomatoes. There shouldn't be a debate. There shouldn't be opinion about it. It either is or it isn't that thing. If I say I'm a follower of Jesus, you should expect that there would be fruit of the Spirit coming out of, of our lives. And, and that's what we need to talk about tonight. I think there's too much of saying one thing but living another thing. There's a whole lot of talk in the world that we live in. There's a whole lot of talk in the church. But what the, what the world needs is that there is evidence of the Spirit's work in our lives that we would bear fruit of a relationship with Jesus and the power of His Holy Spirit. I just grew up sometimes wondering, is it all about speaking in tongues? We place so much emphasis on the power of the Holy Spirit, and rightly so because that gets neglected in a lot of churches, but we don't spend enough time talking about what's the difference it should actually make in my life. So what I speak in tongues, what does my everyday look like? Is there fruit of the Spirit? And Paul talks about this. And we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5 for the next nine weeks because we're going to be talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And instead of just talking to you about it one time and putting them all together, I thought it would be good for us to get really practical. And this is right where we live. This is in our marriages, this is in our relationship with our kids, the little ones and the grown ones. This is in our workplace. This is in any meaningful relationship that we have. We need more of these things, more fruit of the Spirit at work in our lives so we can shine brightly and the gospel can be meaningful uh, in the lives of other people through us. And Paul talks about that very thing in Galatians chapter 5. So we're going to break each one of these down and um, let's just kind of give a little bit of context and and Paul is, he's writing to people who came out of religion and they're kind of getting back into religion. And he's reminding them that Jesus is about a relationship, not just about religion. He's trying to teach them that this thing is personal and it's not about a box you check or just a rule that you keep. It's about a life that you live, it ought to be personal. There ought to be fruit that comes out of your life that is more than just robotic adherence to some religious customs. Now back in the day, the issue was circumcision and that's what he's speaking to because some were prone to go back and say, listen, I've been circumcised, I'm a good Jew, that's all that should matter. And they're arguing about this religious behavior and I'm going to avoid tonight all the jokes that I can make about circumcision, not trying to get canceled here on a Wednesday night prayer meeting. So I'll just skip over all of that stuff and just get right to what Paul says in verse 6. And let's start there. He says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. Paul actually writes a lot about this in other places too. We'll look at some of them. Let's skip down to verse 13, where he talks about life in the Spirit. Praise God, 50 people have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Praise God, you speak in other tongues. Praise God that he's moving in our altars and that our church is growing. Praise God for all of that. But if we don't love, <laughs> what does it matter? It's what, kind of what Paul's talking about. So let's, let's, uh, let's get into to chapter 5. Let's look at verse 13. I'm going to read the next several verses. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. 
But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Pretty good description of what's going on in our culture today, right? Pretty good description of what can even happen in churches if we're not careful. We'll, we'll argue, we'll bite and devour, we'll destroy each other because of our differences. And Paul's calling us to love. I, I, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. That's a really important thing, because the tendency in today's age is to combine a little of this, a little of that. It's called syncretism. You take a little bit from this religion, a little bit from this book, a little bit from this idea, a little bit from how you grew up, a little bit from this over here, and you create your own narrative, you create your own truth, you create a life that's comfortable for you, and that's not at all the gospel. It's not at all life by the Spirit. And this was even happening back then. And, and Paul is saying, you're not to just do whatever you think is right. You're not to just do whatever you want to do. The Spirit is different from the flesh. They are in conflict with each other and what we want is a life by the, to be led by the Spirit to do what He wants us to do and to act like He wants us to act. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, putting anything above God, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and if you haven't found yourself in any of those categories, he puts, and the like, <laughs> just to include every other thing you might be tempted to do, and the like. It's like at the end of a job description, and all other duties assigned by your supervisor is kind of a, a catch-all little phrase that Paul used here. That's a pretty comprehensive list, by the way. I don't think we even have to get to and the like before we find ourselves probably challenged by one of these things or another. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So let's hit rewind then on that list and let's go back and, and that's because that's a pretty important statement. If this is the fruit of your life, you can say what you want, you can come on Wednesday nights, you can give in the offering, but if this is the fruit of your life, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, now I'm listening with different ears because I want to inherit the kingdom of God. I want to spend eternity with Jesus. So I have to evaluate my fruit, what's actually coming out of my life. And so if there is sexual immorality as the fruit of my life, I will not inherit the kingdom of God. If there is impurity and debauchery and idolatry and witchcraft and hatred and discord and jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. If that is the fruit of your life, if that is what's coming off of your tree, if that is how people experience you, Paul warns, then you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's also a pretty comprehensive list. And probably most of us are not a 10 out of 10 on all nine of these fruits. We've got some work to do in one or more of these areas. But this, Paul says, should be the fruit of your relationship with Jesus. This should be the fruit of the Spirit's work in your life. We believe and we've taught that the initial physical evidence of baptism in the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. But it's only the initial physical. There is a life lived in the fruit of the Spirit that sometimes gets ignored. We're not talking about a crisis moment or to check a box that you did something. We're talking about what is the fruit of your everyday life. 
Paul says this is what your life should look like. This should be the fruit. You want to say you're a follower of Jesus? We should expect to see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, gentleness. Those who, uh, he says, against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. So here's the big idea for tonight. These points each week will be pretty simple because we're going to focus on each one of the fruits of the Spirit and talk about how we can grow in those areas each week for the next nine weeks. The fruit of the Spirit in our lives is seen in how we love others. Pretty straightforward. You can't say you're led by the Spirit. You can't really say you're a follower of Jesus if you fail to love others. Jesus would teach that you can't receive forgiveness and not forgive others. You can't receive the love of Jesus and then turn around and not show love to others. The fruit of the Spirit in our lives is seen in how we love other people. Did you know that 67% of all the songs written since 1960 are about love? So in the last 63 years, 67% of all the songs, so two out of every three songs written since 1960 are about love. That's probably not surprising. The, the, it's, it seems like it's in every song. It seems like it's talking about love. And I read an article that said the next most popular topics of songwriters when they're writing songs after the topic of love, which is two out of every three, is money, partying, and depression or country music. I guess that's kind of the same thing. Um, money, partying, partying, depression. I'm in Texas. I probably just offended a whole lot of people. I probably would have been better off talking about circumcision than country music. But nevertheless, it's like we're created for love. And when we don't get it, when we lose it, when we're hurt by it, we try to replace it with things like money and partying which eventually leave us empty and depressed. Is it any accident that most songs are written by love, but the ones that follow money, partying, and depression seem to have a sequential flow to them? That when we don't receive the thing that we need, we look for it in other places, that leaves us wanting, that leaves us empty. We are created for love. And when the Holy Spirit is active in our lives, we learn to live a life of love. We learn to love ourselves. We learn to love the people closest to us. We learn to love people that are different than us. We learn to love on social media. We learn to love strangers and neighbors and co-workers and umpires at youth uh, baseball games. We have to love everybody. When we're led by the Spirit, we learn to live a life of love. And when we don't, things begin to break down. There begins to be some incongruency, or what some might say is hypocrisy, okay? So Pastor Andrew on Sunday morning, by the way, didn't he preach an incredible message? Aren't you thankful for Pastor Andrew, who right now is preaching to our youth? Uh, I, I was so excited for you to hear from him on Sunday, and, and uh, I knew you would enjoy him. And I've gotten so many comments this week on what a great job that he did, which he did. But he, part of what he talked about is... Um, about the next generation. He opened his message just talking about his heart for the next generation, specifically for Gen Z, uh, this generation that's coming up right now, ages 7 to 27. And he talked about how the next generation is typically disappointed and delusioned when it comes to religion and when it comes to the church, and they're leaving the church in record numbers. But I wonder, I was thinking about it this week, I wonder if the issue isn't about Jesus. Because most surveys don't ask about Jesus, they ask about the church, they ask about religion. And we have certain thoughts about church, we have certain thoughts about religion that are often different than our thoughts about Jesus. I wonder if this generation coming up isn't disillusioned and disappointed with the person of Jesus. I wonder if they're disappointed and disillusioned with what they've seen in his followers. 
I wonder if they've seen some incongruence. I wonder if they've seen some hypocrisy. I wonder if their parents drugged them to a boring church when they were seven and they heard the preacher talk about love and then they went home to hear their father yell at their mother and their mother leave their father and that broke their heart and confused their mind. And if this could come up in the church, then what value does it have for me as an adult? Because I saw my family fall apart. I saw an absence of love from people who were supposed to be followers of Christ. I did not see any fruit. You told me that was an apple tree, but I never saw any apples. Maybe they're just not seeing the fruit. Maybe we need to take pretty seriously when Paul teaches us about the fruit of the Spirit. And so let's do some self-evaluation. How do you treat the people closest to you? How do you treat the people around you when no one else is watching? How do you treat people who can't do anything for you? How do you treat people that are different from you? And it's one thing to say, I treat everybody the same, but what if we looked up your Facebook profile? Would it uh, line up with that? How do you treat people who hurt you? How do you love others. Write this down. To love well, we need to do consistently what others just do occasionally. That's what the fruit of the Spirit will do for us in our lives. A good marriage isn't symbolized by just a few good moments over the course of time. A healthy, loving marriage consists of loving the other person in their worst moment and being loved by them in our worst moment. It's till death do us part. It's in sickness and in health. It's, it's loving consistently, not occasionally. It's not about, I did a good deed for somebody in need. It's about, do you love consistently the people around you, the people that are closest to you, the people that you don't know very well, The people that are strangers out there on social media, do you love consistently or do you just do a few good deeds occasionally? Do you just love occasionally? When the Holy Spirit is active in our lives, we begin to love consistently. We begin to see people with the eyes of Jesus. And that's what this world is starving for. They're starving for followers of Jesus to not make politics and the acts that we have to grind and and all of the different things that are dividing us are leading topic, but to lead with love. I'm not saying you can't have a political opinion. I'm not saying you shouldn't vote your conscience. I'm not saying any of those things. We probably agree on most of all of that stuff. I'm just saying, can we lead with love? Can we make that the the first thing that people think about? The, the, The world is dying for churches that will act congruently with what they say. Again, which is not, it's not, um, agreeing or affirming all of the crazy lifestyles that are going on out there. I'm just saying, can we just lead with love? Can we begin conversation? Can we be known for how we love? To love well, we need to do consistently what others do occasionally. This is not easy because sometimes people can be hard to love. Let's be, let's be honest. Which is why we need the help of the Holy Spirit. It's why Jesus knew we needed the Holy Spirit because we would not be able to do this in our own strength. It would be impossible for us. As Paul says, the flesh is always in contradiction or in conflict with the spirit. We need the help of the spirit to overcome the flesh, which is to react, which is to lash out, which is to ignore and withdraw. We need the spirit's help to do what we can't do in our own strength. We need the Holy Spirit to help us love others. I admit it, sometimes I just scroll through social media and occasionally I find really good little videos that help me with my sermons. Um, I don't generally like cats. In fact, I have a strong disdain for cats. Uh, But I found a video of a cat that really, to me, brought out the help we need from the Holy Spirit to love other people. Can we show this little kitten video uh, that I think will help you understand? Look at that little cat. Now watch what he's trying to do. Oh, he's trying to jump up there. He's trying to be a big cat. But he can't quite... Get up on the counter one more time. Let's see that little cat. He wants so bad to get up on that counter, but he just does not have it within himself to jump high enough 
to get where he wants to go. That is a perfect illustration of what it's like to try to love people without the help of the Holy Spirit. You can jump, you can try, you can want to, but you just won't be able to get there without the Holy Spirit helping you go where you can't go and do what you can't do on your own. We need his help to love people. So what does it look like to love well? Well, thankfully, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in the love chapter, which, by the way, is nestled conveniently in between Paul teaching them about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and how they should be used in church. Because as you can imagine, there was some disagreement, there was some chaos, there were some people with a lot of pride about how often they spoke in tongues and about how they could prophesy and about all the religious things they could do. And Paul said, stop it. What does it matter what's going on religiously if you don't love? And so he nestles this love chapter in between a theological explanation of the gifts of the Spirit and how they should be used in church. And here's what he says. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. So, baptism in the Holy Spirit, the evidence of speaking in tongues, is not the end. It is a means to the end, which is to love others with the love of Jesus. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. If our church grows numerically but we don't love well, it doesn't matter. If we build the park at Oaks Church and start Oaks Learning Center, but we don't love our community and we don't love those moms and dads who drop off their kids and love those little kids with the love of Jesus, what's the point? If we, if we have parties of eight and we sit around uh, tables, but we don't love the new person who doesn't look like us and whose life doesn't line up with ours, if we don't love them, what's the point of gathering together? What's the point of any of it? If we don't love, it's actually worse than if we didn't do it. If we do all of this religious activity in the name of Jesus, but do not love, it would have been better if we never showed up at all. He says we got to love. And here's what he says love is. And so this is the standard that we're trying to achieve and the, the standard that we're comparing our lives to. And this is where we are as the little cat trying to jump a little higher. We need the help of the Holy Spirit to love like this. But here's what Paul says love is. Love is patient. And we could stop right there and say, uh-oh, got trouble with that one. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. Husbands, if you're making jokes at the expense of your wife, you dishonor her and you fail to love her. Wives, if you talk negatively about your husband to other people and gain alliances against him, you dishonor him and you fail to love him. Come on, let's apply this to the, let's apply this to the closest relationships that we have. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. With our tongues, they will be stilled. Where there's knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. And he closes with this verse, verse 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. We need the fruit of the Spirit at work in our lives because our marriages are in trouble. Our kids, many of them have stopped paying attention. Our world is broken and hurting. It is absolute chaos out there in many ways. 
There's all kinds of ways to be divided and all kinds of ways to let our emotions get the best of us. So we need the help of the Holy Spirit more than ever to live a life of love, to bear the fruit of love. If you need more of this kind of love in your marriage, with your kids, at work, with people on social media, in our culture, or your next door neighbor, then we need to seek more of the Holy Spirit and ask him to create in us a greater capacity to love. This isn't a marriage series, but it easily could be. I don't believe people fall out of love. I've counseled enough couples that I've heard that statement a bunch of times. It's heartbreaking when you hear it. But I don't feel, I don't believe that people fall out of love. I believe they fall out of understanding of what love is. And somewhere along the way, it becomes all about them. That wasn't the love that we saw in Jesus. It wasn't the love that we're called to in marriage. It's not really what Paul describes as love in 1 Corinthians 13 or really anywhere else. Love is sacrificial. It calls us in Ephesians 5 to mutual submission to meet the needs of others. Men, we're called to love our spouse as Christ loved the church, which he died for. Our marriages need help. Therefore, we need more of the Holy Spirit in our lives to understand and to live a true definition of love. So tonight, if that's where you're at in your marriage or if that's where you're at with your grown kids or if that's where you're at in some relationships to you that matter and you're struggling, if you're one of those people that it just seems to, social media is a trap door that you keep falling in and the worst parts of you tend to come out there, we need help. We need help to think that we can do this on our own is as silly as that little kitten trying to jump up on the counter. It's just not going to happen. You can't do it on your own. But you also can't ignore it. We need to learn to love like Jesus. We need more of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because what did Jesus say? How did he say other people would know we're his disciples? What would be the fruit? It's how they love one another. It's how you love one another. If we want to see differences in our culture, if we want to see differences in the next generation, if we want to see differences in our marriage, when we go back to what Jesus said, they'll know you by your love. The fruit of the Spirit in your life will be love. We need love. So let's come and spend a few minutes at the altar. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. We've got a few minutes here. Might as well come and pray. You're just going to get wet when you leave. Stay dry a few more minutes. And wherever you're at on this spectrum, whatever's going on in your life, let's just come and spend a few minutes in the presence of Jesus, asking him to fill us with his Holy Spirit. Let's empty ourselves of the other stuff and say, Lord, fill us with your spirit so we can love better. And let's just pray that God begins a movement of love in our church that that's how people in this community will know us. So Lord, we're here, we wanna meet with you. You know exactly where we are, what we're going through. Speak to us, fill us full of your Holy Spirit. I pray even tonight there would be people who on their own as they're praying are baptized in your Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues that opens the door to more fruit, to greater fruit than they've ever known. I pray that in the name of Jesus, we're here to meet with you. Thank you, Lord.
you're up here praying, continue to pray. I, I just felt led by the Lord um, for us to agree in prayer on this in a couple of specific ways. And the first thing that I, I would just invite you to agree with me in prayer on is that we would have greater capacity to love the people that are closest to us first in our marriages. Um, sometimes our spouse, well, a lot of times our spouse gets the worst of us. We give everybody else the best parts that we have to offer and we come home and give the worst to the people that are closest to us. And there's a lot of grudges being held against one another. There's a lot of resentment being held in our marriages. And a lot of our marriages are hanging on by a thread. And what we need is the power of the Holy Spirit to do what we can't do, to love in a greater way, to forgive and to let go and to honor and to respect and to submit to one another in love. And so would you just join me? And can we pray over the marriages of Oaks Church? Can we pray over the marriages of this community and ask God to do a miracle of love in our marriages? Let's just agree together for marriages. So Lord, we call on your name right now and we ask that you would bring healing and restoration and ultimately biblical love to our marriages. I pray over the marriages of those in this room right now. Some are probably in this moment fighting for their marriage in prayer. God, I pray that you would intervene and I pray that you would do a miracle. I pray that you would open blind eyes. I pray that you would heal in a moment what the enemy has been trying to tear apart for a lifetime. God, I just pray for restoration and healing and a greater love in the marriages in this room. I pray over the marriages of Oaks Church, the, the hundreds and hundreds of marriages represented by our church. God, I pray that there would be a lower divorce rate at Oaks Church. I pray that there would be no divorces at Oaks Church. God, I pray against separation. I pray against selfishness. Lord, I pray against past hurts. I pray against the, the, the enemy's lies to us that we, we can't ever forgive or move on. Lord, I pray against all of that. And I pray here at Oaks Church, there would just be a unique blessing on marriages that you would restore what's been hurt. God, that you would protect what is right now, that you would call young men and women to marry and to hold sacred the covenant of marriage. I pray a greater capacity for love that comes from your Holy Spirit. I pray greater fruit in the area of our marriages that we would love one another. I pray for the marriages of this community. I pray that this is one of the impacts that our church can make in the community is that we would be known for love and that we would be known for godly loving marriages. And so I pray that God do it. Help us to do our part in that I pray in the name of Jesus. We lift up our marriages. Help us to love better. Um, I want to pray now over specifically adult children. There's a lot of brokenness and division when it comes to some of our adult children. And they sometimes leave our house and they live lifestyles and they make decisions that fracture relationships. And as I was over there praying, I just felt like the Lord put this on my heart. And um, I, I feel like some of you parents of adult children, you're watching what your kids are doing right now and it breaks your heart. But there's a part of you that's embarrassed by it. And you feel like in some way it's a reflection on you. And there may even be a little bit of pride there. I just wanna encourage you to give that to the Lord um, your, your adult children know where you stand. They're not questioning what you believe. It might be time for a new tactic to simply love. And maybe it's from a distance. Uh, every situation is different. But every situation where healing begins is where love increases. And so I'm just gonna pray an ability to love your adult children who may be living in a way that's breaking your heart right now. Even a little embarrassing to you, you don't even know what to do with that emotion. I wanna pray that God brings healing, wholeness, forgiveness, and that through our love, we might win back some of our family members. Can we just agree in prayer in that direction? 
So Lord, we lift up the adult children of those here and those in our church who may have walked away from you, who may be living a lifestyle that is not pleasing to you, who may be making decisions that are breaking our hearts and we feel helpless. We may even feel ashamed to admit, but we're embarrassed by it. We may even feel that it's some reflection on us and we don't know what to do with all of those emotions and so it weighs on us. Ultimately, Lord, we want our, our adult children to have a salvation knowledge of you, that they would be healthy and whole in relationship with you. I just pray that you would bring healing and reconciliation to those relationships that are here tonight. I don't know how many there are, but I, I just believe in my spirit there are some here tonight. That's what they're dealing with, and that's the, that's the biggest thing going on in their hearts and their minds right now. So we pray for their adult children. We pray for them to have a salvation knowledge of you and to walk closely with you. But in the time in between where maybe there's just a lot of hurt and confusion and heartache, cover it with your love. Give us the capacity to love them beyond their behavior, to love them beyond their decisions, to love them like you've loved us in all of our imperfection, in all of our unfaithfulness. You never stop loving us. I pray the capacity for us as parents to love our adult children, even when they're living a way that's breaking our hearts. I pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. I wonder if you would join me in praying for our kids and our youth that right now are being ministered to. Their service is wrapping up. They're probably giving a salvation call in Oaks Youth right now. And students are being ministered to. This generation is, is so hurt and confused and their identity is all over the place. I would just like to pray that they would know beyond the actions of their parents or the hypocrisy of some or, or whatever they've experienced or seen, they would have an encounter with the love of Jesus that would mark them forever. So Lord, we lift up our students to you, our young adults, our middle and high school students, our kids. They have been lied to. They have been tormented by the enemy. They have been solicited to from a corrupt and evil generation. They are facing some of the most difficult challenges of any generation that has come before them. Many of them are disillusioned. Many of them are hurt. Many of them are just looking for an outlet for their angst and insecurities. I pray, number one, that we would do what Pastor Andrew encouraged us to do, that we would be better role models, that we would be better mentors, that we would be more consistent with what we say and what we do. That would help a lot. But I pray no matter what, that they would have a life-changing encounter with the risen Savior, that they would know the reality of your love that would cover a multitude of sins and draw them in in a way they, they can't ignore or escape. And so I pray for that generation, Lord, that they would know your love in a profound way and that it would mark them above all else in the name of Jesus. One more prayer I'd like us to pray in agreement together tonight. The Lord is moving in our church right now. We're seeing growth, salvations. Nearly 200 people have been saved in the last three weeks. It's incredible. But there's a whole community of people that desperately need the love of Jesus and are depending on us to show it to them. So I just want to pray a unique ability for our church to demonstrate the love of Jesus, to live the fruit of the Spirit in this way in the days, weeks, and months to come. Can we pray in that direction as we close our time together? So Lord, I pray over our church, this family. God, give us a keen awareness, a focused purpose, a clear assignment every day to demonstrate your love to the people around us everywhere we go, in, in the grocery store, uh, in line at Starbucks, uh, at the PTA meeting, 
in the meeting with our teachers, at the youth baseball game, sitting around people that we don't even know are overhearing our conversation. God, I pray that we would represent you well. God, I pray that we would demonstrate your love well. I pray against putting our foot in our spiritual mouths. I pray against incongruent living. I pray that we would be a church, a church that lives out the love of Jesus in our homes and everywhere else we go. So give us opportunity and give us awareness of where we're missing the mark and help Oaks Church to love well in the days, weeks, and months to come that we would see true fruit happen in our lives and in the lives of the people around us. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Can everybody say a good amen? Amen. 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 It's our heart to love well. If you want to stay and pray, feel free to do that. I want to dismiss you now. I know you want to get home, hopefully, before any more storms roll through. Go pick up your kids. Blessings on you as you go tonight. Safety and protection. Sunday morning is going to be great. I've got a word from James chapter 1 that I'm very excited to share with you. It's going to be a great day in the house of the Lord. I've asked the Lord for no rain. So hopefully he'll help us out on Sunday. I love you guys. We'll see you Sunday morning. God bless. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining Oaks Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. That's right. And we want to let you know that we would love to connect with you through our online family in our OC Online Facebook group. To do that, you can like our Oaks Church page and click Join Group. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll have access to life-giving sermons and worship that will be a blessing to you and your family. Yeah, we'd love to have you join us live for our Sunday and Wednesday services. We hope you have a great day today. Thank you for watching and God bless.